Just as dawn was breaking, Simon found himself standing before an enormous mirror that dominated one wall of his high-rise office, its reflective surface providing a panoramic view of the city's skyscrapers. His mind was busy at work, organizing thoughts and plans for the day ahead, but one particular thought kept tugging at his attention, refusing to be dismissed. With a determined attempt to shift his focus, he redirected his gaze elsewhere in the room. His eyes came to rest upon a young woman who, having completed her cleaning tasks, was meticulously trimming dead leaves from the office's indoor plants. Simon watched her quiet diligence for a moment before approaching her, a small smile playing on his lips. He waited patiently for her to finish her task and turned to face him. As soon as she noticed him, Simon initiated the conversation. Your name's Julia, isn't it? he asked. Julia was visibly startled, not expecting any conversation with her employer. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't see you there. I'll be done shortly, she responded, her hands quickly gathering the discarded leaves and pruning scissors. You didn't answer my question. Oh, yes, sir. I'm Julia. My apologies. I didn't expect you this early. The office clock read seven. The official opening wasn't until nine. Well, you seemed so engrossed in your work that I didn't want to disturb you. Disordered plans really bothered me, you know. Julia offered him a shy smile. I'll be done in about ten minutes. She was cut off before she could complete her sentence. You've done enough. The plan looks fine to me. Julia glanced around uncertainly. All right, then. May I leave? I'm not the one to decide that. If you believe you've finished your work, you should head home and rest. It was clear that Julia had arrived early, and now the office sparkled with cleanliness. Simon Feist's early arrival at the office was intentional. He had barely caught any sleep last night, staying awake until 2 in the morning, when the police called him to collect his misbehaving son. In fact, he was so frustrated he wanted to tell them off and leave the issue for them to handle. His patient was running thin with his son's repeated mishaps. He was 26, but still lacked basic sense. However, his wife Melinda stirred and asserted her viewpoint that Simon should go get their son. Reluctantly, he drove to the police station. After a few stern slaps to his son and his friends, Simon drove each of them home. By the time he returned home, the sun was about to rise. Seeing Melinda and the maid nursing his son with tea in the compress, he fought the urge to reprimand his son once more to instill some sense of proper behavior in him. Peter was brought up with every luxury and opportunity a child could ever dream of. He was Simon's most cherished project, his most significant investment. From a tender age, Peter was showered with top-notch private tutoring. Simon spared no expense in employing the best teachers and trainers to cultivate his son's talents. In his younger years, Peter was an obedient and promising child. He was receptive to his parents and excelled in middle school, earning him multiple accolades in academics and sports. Peter showed all signs of being an ideal successor to Simon. However, as time passed, a subtle but disturbing change crept into their lives. Peter began showing signs of rebellion and became increasingly difficult to manage. After finishing ninth grade, Simon, in an attempt to instill discipline and focus, sent him to one of the country's best boarding schools. Peter's educational journey then led him to a prestigious college, but this too ended prematurely when he decided to drop out after just a year and a half. Four years had elapsed since Peter returned to his hometown after dropping out of college. Not once had he experienced a day's work during that time. But what Peter lacked in employment he made up for in revelry. Despite Simon repeatedly blocking his credit card to teach him the value of money, his mother invariably supplied her own card to him. Flaunting the family name, Peter roamed the town, with every misstep conveniently overlooked by those who knew of his lineage. Any discussion about the necessity for him to shape up and act responsibly seemed to go in one ear and out the other, making no impact on Peter's carefree existence. This time, however, Peter had truly crossed the line. Accompanied by the sons of Simon's business associates, they had brazenly stolen a police car careening through the city in a drunken joyride. The consequences of this act, especially regarding what Simon would now owe the police chief, remained uncertain. Simon and the police chief were well acquainted, 
and Simon had made it abundantly clear that his tolerance for his son's antics was wearing thin. The gravity of his latest fiasco was not lost on him. Snapping back to present, Simon turned his attention back to Julia. Julia, tell me, why is a young woman like yourself working as a cleaner? He asked, genuine curiosity in his voice. Julia responded with a modest smile. I'm taking evening classes. I can only work during the early morning and evening because I need to take care of my mother during the day. Occasionally, our neighbor helps out, but she has her own life to manage. So I clean office spaces in the morning like here and work a part-time waitress shop in the evenings. Simon was caught off guard by the weight of responsibilities she carried at such a young age. Julia, why do you have to work so much? Don't you also need time to focus on your studies? He inquired. She shrugged, an air of resilience surrounding her. I've been managing it for a while now. My mother is seriously ill and her medications are costly. I also have a brother who, let's say, doesn't make the best life choices. Sometimes things happen, but it doesn't matter. I'm sorry for the talk. I finished my job here. I should be on my way now. Simon found himself in a state of disbelief. The encounter with Julia had been a stark reminder of the harsh realities that some people faced daily, people just a few floors below his office in the towering skyscraper. As he watched her leave, he resolved to learn more about her. By evening, Simon had gathered a wealth of information about Julia. Initially, he had suspected that she might have been exaggerating her circumstances, but upon confirmation of every detail, he felt a profound sense of admiration. Despite his social stature and privilege, he felt humbled by Julia's resilience and commitment. This interaction opened his eyes to the trials and tribulations of the many people who struggled just to get by each day. Recognizing Julia's strong work ethic and her commitment to supporting her family, Simon felt a strong urge to help her. He dialed his accountant and instructed an increase in Julia's salary. As a respected and effective leader within the company, his decision was accepted without question. Upon receiving a firm affirmation from the accountant, he ended the call. Arriving home that evening, Simon noticed a group of his son's friends lurking near their front gate, one of their cars hidden around a nearby corner. He observed them from a distance, his mind churning. Are they planning more mischief? How much longer will this go on? A wave of frustration welled up within him just as he noticed Peter descending the house steps towards him. Hey, Peter, did you get enough rest? Simon called out. Peter, taken aback by his father's unusually calm demeanor, shot him a suspicious look. Uh, yeah? I slept well? Why'd you ask that? Just curious, that's all. Can you step inside for a moment? Simon led the way back into the house without a backward glance. Peter, sensing a serious conversation looming, had no choice but to follow. He knew his father had a long fuse, but when it reached its end, the consequences were usually unpleasant. This is how Peter found himself enrolled in a strict educational institution in England. Not only was he required to abide by a regimented routine, but he also had to resume his studies. What did I even do? Peter thought to himself. We were just messing around. No one got hurt and the car's fine. His mother glanced worriedly between her husband and son. Did you forget something, son? But before Peter could reply, his father answered for him. Of course he forgot. He forgot that he's a human being, not a wild animal. Can anyone explain why I should be the one ashamed of my son's actions? Why is it that others can take pride in their children while I'm left feeling embarrassed? Simon, dear, but he... Silence! Simon had only raised his voice at Melinda twice before in their life together, and both instances were due to Peter. Stunned, she fell silent as Simon extracted the bundle of newspapers from his briefcase. Here, take a good look at your precious son. The photographs were damning. One could clearly see Peter shamelessly bearing his backside as they zoomed past a police station in a stolen police car. Peter had to fight the urge to burst out laughing at the sight of the pictures. He knew well enough that laughing now would land him in deeper trouble. His mind then flashed to the party planned for later that evening. Damn, seems like I won't be making it to the party tonight, Peter silently lamented. His father then turned to him, his gaze stern. Whether you like it or not, 
I am determined to mold you into a responsible man. If I fail, I'll simply evict you and see how you fare on your own. For the first time, Peter felt a punch in the gut at his father's words. Feelings of betrayal and abandonment flooded him. In that moment, Peter resolved to prove his maturity and independence. I can make my own decisions about what to do and when, he retorted, sensing a turning point. This response was unexpected to Simon. In past confrontations regarding Peter's misadventures, the conversations usually ended with admonitions and promises of better behavior. Simon was so inflamed by his son's rebuttal that he turned an alarming shade of purple. Whipping out his phone, he dialed a number. Head of security, I need you immediately, he commanded into the receiver. In the midst of the heated exchange, Melinda quietly approached Peter, wrapping her arms around him in a comforting embrace. She understood Simon well. Once he committed to a course of action, there was no deviating from it. She had repeatedly warned Peter to tread cautiously, playing the role of the empathetic mediator in the family and often defending him. Now, however, she was certain Peter would have to confront the repercussions of his actions, despite her consistent pleas for him to be more considerate. Her heart ached as she realized the extent of the predicament her son had gotten himself into. The head of security arrived within 15 minutes. Throughout the wait, Simon remained seated, glaring at his son with a stern countenance. Mr. Feist? Yes, Hank. Come in. A tall, well-built man made his way towards his employer. I want you to take a good look at this thoughtless individual, Simon gestured towards his son. Maintaining a professional demeanor, Hank didn't flinch. Yes, sir, of course. That's Peter, your son. Do whatever you have to. Put him in shackles, assign guards, but he must not step foot off the property until I say otherwise. Is that clear? Absolutely. We'll ensure that. Dismissed. With a curt nod, Hank exited the room. Peter, left alone with his father, was dumbfounded. Have you lost your mind? This is not the Middle Ages. You can't discipline children like this anymore. Simon let out a scornful chuckle. He took a few steps, his hands tucked into his pockets, before halting and looking Peter dead in the eyes. This isn't your punishment, son. This is merely a measure to buy me some time to devise your actual punishment. And trust me, I will come up with one. Now go to your room. But Dad, I've said my piece. Simon's voice echoed in the room, leaving no room for further arguments. His decision was final. Peter was left with no choice but to accept the bitter reality and retreat. The following morning, Simon found himself awake unusually early. A glance at the clock revealed it was a mere 5 a.m. He felt no desire to return to sleep, and the thought of remaining at home wasn't appealing either. With a sense of quiet determination, he rose from his bed, swiftly got ready, and decided to start his day ahead of schedule, heading off to his workplace. Simon harbored a profound love for his work, Having constructed his own steel company from the ground up, he was now among the wealthiest individuals in the state. His journey into the world of steel processing began when he was just a teenager, working as an ordinary laborer in a scrap metal yard. His rise from humble beginnings to a titan of industry had been a result of his relentless dedication and an undying work ethic. In his early years, Simon was raised in a family that didn't have much. His father, Tom Fiest, was employed in a steel mill and worked tirelessly to keep food on the table. Simon's mother, Linda, was a preschool teacher who nurtured young minds with unwavering dedication. However, when Simon was only five years old, tragedy struck as Linda was fatally struck by a runaway truck. The loss devastated Tom. The love of his life, the woman he cherished, had been taken from him abruptly, leaving a gaping void that proved difficult to fill. His grieving period extended over a year, casting a somber shadow over their lives. Despite his tender age of six, Simon possessed an uncanny maturity. He recognized the self-destructive pattern his father was sinking into as he mourned the loss of his wife. Like his father, Simon yearned for his mother's presence, but he understood that he wouldn't see her again. One day, in a bid to lift his father's spirits, he mentioned his desire to have siblings to play with. That seemingly innocent request acted as a catalyst for Tom. A few months later, Tom began dating a young woman from their town, and not long after, they tied the knot. 
A year later, Simon welcomed twin brothers, Sam and Ben, into the family. He swiftly adapted to his role as a big brother, spending endless hours playing with the twins and showering them with the love and care he once wished for himself. Much like his father, Simon didn't excel in academics. Instead, he had a keen interest in mechanics and heavy machinery. Tom frequently took him to the steel mill, and Simon was instantly captivated by the world of steel processing, setting the stage for his future endeavors. Simon plunged into work at the metal yard in ninth grade, a stark contrast to his twin brothers who thrived academically. Sam and Ben excelled in school, consistently ranking among the top students. Despite the difference in their pursuits, Simon harbored no resentment or feelings of inadequacy. He was their older brother, and he was proud of their achievements. Whispers from people outside their immediate family circle suggested that Jenny, Simon's stepmother, might not have the same affection for him as she did for her biological sons, but these speculations couldn't have been further from the truth. Jenny loved Simon deeply and saw him as an integral part of their family. He was, after all, the older brother to her twin sons. However, tragedy struck once again when a metal bar fell onto Tom's knee during work. The accident incapacitated Tom, forcing Simon and Jenny to shoulder the responsibility of providing for the family. Simon was acutely aware of the transformative power of education. He promised himself and his family that he would do everything in his power to ensure that his brothers received the quality education they deserved. Simon's commitment to his family's welfare was a testament to his maturity and responsibility, qualities that would serve him well in his future. His success didn't come from luck or overnight brilliance, but rather from years of relentless dedication, sweat, and learning on the job. Even when he had been a simple worker, handling scraps in the yard, he had always been inquisitive. He used to ask his seniors about the processes, materials, and business side of things. He wasn't content with just knowing how to do his job. He wanted to understand how everything worked. His education didn't stop after high school. Despite not attending college like his brothers, he continued learning on the job, not only about the practical side of things, but also about business, management, and innovation. His brothers, Sam and Ben, went on to become consultants. They used their formal education and business acumen to help Simon transform the small steel company into a large industry player. They formed an effective team, with Simon's practical experience and industry knowledge combining well with his brother's strategic and management insights. Through his own journey, Simon came to deeply understand the value of hard work, perseverance, and continuous learning. These values were instilled in him from his early years and stayed with him as he led his company to success. He also understood the importance of family and loyalty. His brothers had stood by him, contributing their expertise to his dream, and he had always been there for them. Given his background, it wasn't surprising that he was dismayed by his son's lack of discipline and focus. He wanted Peter to understand that life wasn't just about enjoying the fruits of someone else's labor but about hard work, responsibility, and making a meaningful contribution. Simon arrived at the office earlier than usual and saw Julia attentively polishing the glass entrance doors. She noticed him and looked surprised. Mr. Feist? You're quite early today, she said, still holding on to her cleaning supplies. Yes, I had trouble sleeping. Julia, would you be able to find me some coffee and a small bite to eat? The secretary won't be in until eight. He responded with a wary smile. Of course, Mr. Feist, I'll get you those right away. Soon they were sitting in Simon's office, a warm cup of coffee in his hand. Simon observed Julia from across his desk. She was a pretty girl, but her tired eyes betrayed her strenuous life. Yet her voice was vibrant and lively. He noticed her glancing at him, curiosity in her eyes. Is something on your mind, sir? She asked, unable to hold back her concern. Her words tugged at Simon's heartstrings, and he found himself battling tears. He realized that it had been a while since someone genuinely cared about him. Even the wealthiest among us shed tears, he mused, recalling a line from a movie. Inexplicably, Simon found himself opening up to Julia. He felt good to have someone listen. Julia paid close attention, nodding every so often, and then said with a warm smile, You know, Mr. Feist? Having it all doesn't always guarantee happiness. You may look at me and think, I have it rough, 
with all the work and taking care of my sick mother, but I wouldn't say it's tough. It's just life. It's as beautiful or as harsh as anyone else's. The best part about me is that I stop myself from complaining. I choose to be happy with what I have. Simon was touched by her words and felt a deep sense of respect for her. Julia, could you tell me more about your mother? My mother used to be a clerk at a juvenile detention center, Julia began, her voice steady. One evening, she was coming home from work when she saw a group of teenagers fighting on the street. She couldn't ignore it, not when she knew too well the consequences that could follow for those kids. So, she tried to break up the fight. One of the boys pushed her and she fell, hitting the curb hard. She needed multiple surgeries after that, and to live without constant pain, she relies heavily on medication. She needs another operation, but her insurance only covered a small portion of the expenses. I've been trying to cover the rest, but the cost of future surgeries... Julia trailed off, looking down at her hands. Simon was silent for a moment, digesting the information. A crazy idea formed in his head, one he wasn't even sure he should voice. He surprised himself when he blurted out, Julia, how old are you? Taken aback by the abrupt shift in conversation, she looked at him with wide eyes. 22, she answered. I have a proposition for you. He continued speaking slowly to ensure he chose his words correctly. Would you be interested in an opportunity to earn a substantial amount of money? You could afford your mother's operation and alter your current lifestyle. Suspicion flickered in her eyes. What do I have to do? Kill someone? She joked, trying to lighten the heavy atmosphere. Simon gave a half smile. Not quite, but you're not entirely off track. I need you to marry my son. Julia choked on her coffee, a fit of coughing following. Excuse me? She gasped once she recovered. Julia, Simon began, his voice calm and reassuring. I have a plan. Trust me. As Simon elaborated on his plan, Julia struggled to grasp the reality of what he was suggesting. The enormity of his proposition left her reeling, her mind a whirlwind of confusion and disbelief. Yet despite the unusual nature of the arrangement, she couldn't help but consider it. The thought of being able to provide for her mother's medical needs was all-consuming. It wasn't about love or marriage. It was a business deal, a contract, a chance to drastically improve the quality of her mother's life. Simon watched her as she processed the proposition, his gaze steady. You don't have to decide right now, he reassured her, leaning back in his chair. Take some time, think it over. But remember, Julia, this is a unique opportunity, one that could change your life and your mother's life for the better. She nodded slowly, her mind racing. I'll think about it, Mr. Feist. She managed to stammer, standing up and leaving the room in a daze. As she exited, Simon sighed heavily, sinking back into his chair. He had planted the seed. Now all he could do was wait and see if it would take root. Peter found himself standing at the altar, his gaze lingering on the young woman beside him, Julia. She looked beautiful in her wedding gown, her face a mix of determination and apprehension. He couldn't believe that his father had orchestrated this entire event. To the world, it was an elegant wedding, but to him, it felt like a bizarre dream. They exchanged vows as rehearsed, the words leaving their lips almost mechanically. As they exited the church, Peter couldn't help but feel a sense of dread creeping in. But then he saw Simon's stern face and knew there was no joking around. The wedding reception was held at a grand restaurant. A lavish spread was laid out. The hall was buzzing with their father's business acquaintances. But Peter felt a chill amidst the warm merriment. He looked around, the reality of the situation slowly sinking in. He turned to Simon, disbelief etched in his features. Dad, this is a joke, right? No, Peter, it's not. Simon's voice was firm, devoid of any emotion. He explained the situation, how a lawsuit was impending and the only solution was this hastily arranged marriage to a girl from the complainant's family. He told Peter about the change he would have to make, living in the country, providing for his family, starting afresh. Peter felt a surge of anger. You can't just decide this for me. Are you out of your mind? The stoic expression on Simon's face didn't waver. Peter, there is no going back now. You have had countless chances and you have wasted them all. It's time you learn to take responsibility. 
Frustrated, Peter excused himself and went to the restroom. Alone, he let out a bitter laugh. The reflection in the mirror looked unfamiliar. A groom forced into maturity overnight. But Peter was a rebel at heart. He would go along with his charade for now. But once the fanfare settled down, he would reclaim his freedom. Peter was not one to be controlled. Not by his father. Not by anyone. As the wedding celebration carried on, Simon was approached by Mark a well-known businessman who was both a friend and associate. Simon, you've truly taken us by surprise, Mark declared, his tone carrying a mix of shock and amusement. Simon responded with a grin. Well, I'm glad you're having fun, Mark. Mark leaned in closer, his voice barely a whisper as he asked, Do you really think you can change him? Simon looked at him, his smile fading into a frown, while Mark let out a sly chuckle, continuing. The reality is that we ourselves are to blame, and nothing can change them now. Simon cast a glance at his new daughter-in-law and chuckled. Well, we'll see about that. He was then interrupted by a call on his phone and excused himself to answer it. Julia, the new Mrs. Feist, was unconcerned about the opinions swirling around her. She understood that her life could take unexpected turns, but at the moment, she was indifferent. Her focus was her mother's health, and when she received a call from the hospital informing her that all her mother's medical bills had been covered and the operation paid for, her next task was to find the wedding dress. Without fuss, she selected the first dress she found and tried it on. As the wedding festivities concluded, all the guests departed. Peter and Julia were chauffeured to their new home in the country. As the car pulled up in front of a humble, rustic house, Peter looked on in disbelief. This? This is where we're living? He stammered. Yes, it is. Now quit dawdling and get inside. We have an early start tomorrow, Julia commanded, her tone leaving no room for argument. The following day, it dawned on Peter that not only was there no honeymoon in sight, but he wasn't even being waited on hand and foot like he was accustomed to. His new bride was absent most of the day, leaving early in the morning for work and only returning in the evening to seclude herself in her room with her books. On one occasion, Peter knocked on her bedroom door, irritation lining his voice. Excuse me, aren't you supposed to cook for your husband? He demanded, but his question fell on deaf ears. Julia continued to ignore him, unswayed by his protests. A week later, Peter realized that he needed to find a job. He aimlessly roamed a small town hunting for any kind of work that would earn him some money. His journey led him to an unexpected place, a steel warehouse. It was the last place he'd ever thought he'd find himself in, but desperate times called for desperate measures. That evening, Peter came home in an entirely different mood. He had secured his first job. Bursting through the door of the house, he couldn't help but boast about his day to Julia. He noticed her glance at his rust-stained t-shirt, and then she simply smiled not uttering a word in return. In response to his news, Juliet began to silently set the table. The sight of it was foreign to Peter, but it filled him with a sense of accomplishment. For the first time since he moved into that house, he was served dinner. It was a small victory, but a significant change in their daily routine. Over time, their interactions gradually evolved from the initial estrangement to a level of familiarity. They began to converse more, sharing anecdotes and even indulging in lighthearted banter. Each day, a strange longing to return home earlier and see Julia started creeping into Peter's heart. It was an unfamiliar feeling, but he didn't shy away from it. Their relationship began to bloom subtly, transforming from a mere contract to a genuine bond that was warm and comforting. Half a year had elapsed. Simon quite frankly, was wary of the derisive comments from his business associates. He had even begun to feel a pang of sympathy for his son. Peter's friends seemed to be reveling in their usual fun and frolic, while his own son was banished to the countryside. To maintain the facade, Julia had even resigned from her job so as not to arouse Peter's suspicions. Simon hadn't heard directly from Peter for quite some time. He and Julia had agreed to communicate only in case of emergencies, otherwise he just expected a simple assurance from her that everything was fine. One evening, Simon returned home from work to find his wife Melinda, visibly concerned. Darling, where's our son? Is he really okay? You keep showing me these messages that he's doing fine, but we haven't seen him for months. Simon had been anticipating this conversation with his wife. 
surprised that it had taken this long for her to express her concerns. It was a testament to the level of respect she had for her husband's decisions. Secretly, Simon yearned to see his son too. He had been suppressing the desire to simply show up at his son's doorstep. But now that his wife had finally voiced her fears, he resolved to act. Enough is enough. Tomorrow I'll go and bring him back, he decided internally. Hank, his informer, had reported just a week ago that Peter had received the promotion and that something seemed to be brewing between him and Julia. Simon, however, dismissed it as highly improbable. The original agreement with Julia was to seclude Peter from his harmful circle of friends. Simon knew his son all too well. People didn't just change overnight. Taking the decision, he made his way to their humble dwelling the next day. As he alighted from his car and scrutinized a small house, he wondered how his son had managed to live in such a place. He ascended the few steps and knocked on the door. The delicious aroma wafting from the inside was inviting. Come in, a voice called out. As he pushed the door open and stepped inside, the sight before him left him momentarily stunned. Julia was laying the table, and there was his son, his own son who had never lifted a finger before, washing the dishes. The smiles that graced their faces were genuine and warm. Dad? Wow, haven't seen you in a while, huh? What brings you here? Peter jested, but his eyes betrayed a sincere happiness upon seeing his father. Julia, too, smiled warmly at Simon. Hello, Mr. Feist. Do come in. We're just about to celebrate Peter's latest achievement. Simon blinked. Was this a dream? As they gathered around the table, a mouth-watering aroma of roasted chicken filled the room. Finally, driven by curiosity, he had to ask, What's the achievement we're celebrating? Well, Dad, Peter began, I secured a job at the local steel mill. You know the one owned by your competitor? I started off as a loader and recently got promoted. I proposed a few changes to improve the plant operations, and believe it or not, they promoted me to be an assistant to the plant manager. I even got a bonus. We're planning to use it for some home improvements and thought we'd have a little celebration as well. Simon was taken aback by his son's words. The last he remembered, Peter was a reckless boy, more interested in living off his father's fortune than anything else. He'd never shown any initiative or responsibility in his life. But the man sitting before him now was a completely different person. He seemed mature, confident, and most surprisingly, content. Home improvements? That was all Simon could manage. He saw a spark in Julia's eyes, and there was a genuine contentment in his son's demeanor. Simon felt a rush of happiness. He immediately dialed his wife's number and urged her to join them, abruptly ending the call before she could question him. Melinda, anxious and not knowing what to expect, asked her driver Hank to rush her to the house immediately. Fearing the worst, she burst into the house, only to find them all chatting and laughing. Relief washed over her, and she broke down in tears. After a few minutes, when she realized the situation wasn't as dire as she had initially thought, she began to laugh along with them. The atmosphere was light and cheerful, a stark contrast to what she had expected. The family spent the rest of the evening enjoying dinner together. Afterwards, Melinda and Julia found themselves in the kitchen, clearing up the table and engaging in light-hearted banter. Simon, on the other hand, had asked Peter to join him on the porch for some fresh air. Simon felt a knot of tension in his stomach, contemplating how he could bring up a particularly sensitive topic. Gathering his courage, he finally spoke. Son, there's something you need to know. Peter's face broke into an amused grin. Dad, if you're talking about what I think you're talking about, then there's no need. Simon was taken aback. Julia told me everything. It came up when I asked her to fulfill her marital duties. If you catch my drift, Peter said with a chuckle. He paused for a moment before continuing. You were pretty shrewd in choosing Julia, but I gotta tell you, she wasn't interested in me at all in the beginning. Peter saw his father's stunned expression and couldn't help but chuckle. He'd caught his father off guard, and the moment was priceless. Actually, you know what, Dad? Thank you for everything. If it weren't for your harsh decision... I would have never met Julia, and I'd probably never know what wonderful women exist in this world. So you guys are already... Simon let the question trail off, feeling a tad uncomfortable. Yes, Dad, Peter confirmed, grinning. Simon's initial plan hadn't quite gone as expected, but rather than failing, it had evolved into something much more profound and beneficial than he could ever anticipate it. 
His attempt to teach his son a lesson had unintentionally led to a transformation, a new beginning for Peter and in some ways for their entire family. Dad, if us staying together wasn't in your original plan, don't fret. We're happy here and I can manage things. I may not become a millionaire like you, but I'll do everything in my power to provide for my family. Simon silently turned around and walked back into the house, his heart filled with a strange mixture of pride and relief. Julia, enough of this, Simon announced, his voice firm. Start packing your suitcases. I can't have my son helping my competitors out. You both are moving back home with us. A year later, Simon had the pleasure of welcoming his grandson into their big, loving family. Peter and Julia became integral parts of Simon's business. Peter, with his newfound diligence and discipline, quickly ascended the ranks to become one of the top managers. Julia, leveraging her strong communication skills, assumed the pivotal role in the communications department. Their lives had changed dramatically, but they were happier than they ever were before. Julia's mother had successfully recovered from her illness, and the family decided to celebrate this victory with a grand dinner. Even though Julia and Peter insisted she move in with them, she politely declined. She expressed her desire to continue living in the tranquility of the countryside, which she had grown to love. This is exactly why Julia is invaluable to my son, Simon declared, his voice filled with warmth and respect. We'll have plenty of time at your house, I assure you. The room echoed with laughter and clinks of glasses, marking another beautiful chapter in their lives. A few weeks later, Simon was sitting in his office when there was a soft knock on the door. Come in, he called out. Mr. Feist, someone is here to see you. Let them in, I was expecting them. His friend and business associate George walked in, his face unusually pale. What happened to you, George? Simon asked, concern clear in his voice. Simon, I don't know what to do with Nate. He's gone off the rails. What's the issue this time? They were involved in a hit and run. Thankfully, the victim survived, but he's a lawyer. And guess who was driving? Simon sighed. I can only guess. Have you considered not bailing him out? Let him deal with the consequences for once. That's easy for you to say. You or Peter is doing so well building a successful company from scratch. Did they make another acquisition? Yeah. He plans to start a tool manufacturing facility in the city, Simon said, a hint of pride in his voice. He then looked at his friend and smiled. George, remember how you guys... Simon started, but George interrupted him. I know, I know. We were wrong, okay? We laughed then, but I guess... It's not likely to find another Julia for Nate. Simon nodded in agreement. That's true. Julia is indeed one in a billion. But do consider my advice. Let your son face the consequences of his actions. Just don't let things get too out of hand. Pretend you're not interfering. Thanks, Simon. I'll give it a shot, George said, a hint of hope in his voice. Simon leaned back in his chair, reflecting on his journey. He was reminded of an old saying, Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men create hard times. The saying seemed to fit both his son and his daughter-in-law Julia, but he hoped they could prevent the cycle from coming full circle.